The civil rights movement today is often thought of as history, but Professor Bell's story is proof that if it continues, he left Harvard University's prestigious School of Law to protest the lack of minority women among his faculty. Today, Derek Bell is visiting professor at New York University and keynote speaker at a conference entitled The Struggle for Equality. He joins us now with his own experience of that struggle. Welcome, my friend. It's good to see you Thank again. You. Good to, to see you. Uh, it's been a while, and I continue to read about you and, and, and quarrel with, the, with Harvard and the faculty, but let me put the, draw back from that for a moment and talk about civil rights today and where you see that and, and, uh, and some of the ideas that might be coming out of this conference. Are we making any progress? If, if you try to measure progress in traditional gains, which I think we've done since yeah. the 40s, then we're not making any progress. Civil rights is cyclical. Rights uh, are gained in one era, lost in another. And what I will likely shock the conference in the keynote tomorrow is saying that, in my view, racism in America is permanent. It's not an aberration. It's not something that with a few more laws, better enforced, a more liberal Supreme Court, a better president, that it's all going to go away. Uh, racism is more than a group of bad white folks, you see. It is built into the society. This is a society based on property ownership. It's what it's all about. That's why we got started. Most people, most white people, do not have very much property. What they substitute, at least psychologically, is a sense of identification with other white people who do have the property and, and a sense of, of, of uh, superiority to blacks who are the designated others in this society. And it has worked for 300 years, Charlie. But uh, i got lots of questions. <laughs> Does it work with yeah. respect to white people and others that are not black, but of an, another uh, immigrant group, for example? Now, the, the amazing thing about it is that... Asians, for example. Well, in Asia or in Europe, people who, because of religion or custom or God knows what, were at each other's throats, yeah. come over here and there is a basis for bonding that whatever else they are not, they are identified or able to identify. So it works certainly with Eastern Europeans, uh, but it also works with Asians. Uh, it works uh, uh, with, with people coming. They come over here and they realize they are not on the bottom. In that sense, that sense that they are somehow connected with those on the top and can disown themselves from the, on the bottom is a wonderful stabilizing influence. And we see our politicians use it all the time. Our president got elected notwithstanding the tremendous gaps in wealth and income, the needs for health care weren't even issues, weren't even serious issues last time because he talked about Willie Horton. And Willie Horton was the 1988 uh, Keyword that everybody understood. Now, what are the Republicans going to use for the keyword in in '92? We're not sure, but they will have one. And the Democrats, knowledgeable about how this, will be unable to respond. I'll give you one that they'll use. Not whether it's Republicans or Democrats, politicians will use is quotas. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that you're, is I think the same right. kind of symbolism that, right. that Willie Hart That's of right. a different notion. That's right. But, now, the but fact is, we have, we, we have we have all kinds of quotas at, at Harvard. We, in, in most prestigious schools, you have plenty of quota for the children of alumni, particularly contributing right. alumni. Nobody says a daggone thing, you right. see. It's only when this kind of advantage of preference is done uh, to remediate past racial discrimination that suddenly it creates an uproar. It's an ama but it's part of this bonding situation that it's okay if by virtue of class you get an advantage. Mm -hmm. But in this society, blacks should not get it. It's not on the basis of race yeah. because whites do it all the time. If, if in fact, we are, a, if we have a kind of permanent racism here and it's, not, it's structural and it's economic grounded, as you're suggesting, and almost class, does that mean, in your judgment, that we're facing a permanent underclass in America of which a large percentage are black? Unless something happens that it's hard for me to imagine. The answer is the answer is yes, and that seems very despairing. Uh, you see, I mean, does that mean you're going to give up? They say, and it seems to me that it, it doesn't. 
I think our mistake has been, as I said at the outset, is that we kept assuming that with one more little thing, everything would change. Well, we have 300 years of history. I have 30 years of personal experience. Yeah, but that's not going to happen. Here is the argument will be made, as you know, and you've heard it many times. Uh, if you look back at to how much progress has been made since 1954, since Board of Education, and then in the 60s was with civil rights, and then with the voting rights bill. And now you see a black woman just nominated by her party to be a member of the United States Senate. I don't want to be looking at tokens, but I do want to suggest that perhaps if, if we look at that short span of time, that this enormous foundation of racism has been cracked to a certain degree with those kinds of evidence. If, if, you, if you said that in a public opinion poll, you'd probably get a majority right. agreeing with you, but they'd all be wrong. Why would they be wrong? Because if look at, look at the overall situation of black people in this country, not the ones that get to be senators, not right. the ones that get to be professors at Harvard Law School. The fact is that the income disparity is greater, the number of people unemployed is greater, the breakup of families is, is, is what well, we see. We, all, we almost have a genocidal condition. In the, in, in the, what in the do you make community? then of those arguments by people like Shelby Steele? Naive is about the kindest thing that I can. Naive, I can, just uh, naive, uh, naive in the sense when he in, looks at, and, and to, says, see, "Avoid a victim." The the interesting thing is that in the in the wondrous thing is that not every black academic is not jumping up on a platform someplace and saying something similar to, uh, to Shelby Steele. Because it is a, an immediate guarantee of national fame, attention, yeah. books, what, to, to be supportive of Shelby Steele? No, to, to, to say oh, yeah. in some ways that it ain't your fault, white folks, right. it's ours. Right. You see. Uh, and we have, we have Tom Sowell, who right. does, Tom Sowell, does who's that, out of Stanford and uh, a whole, whole list. And yeah. it's a, well, we have a man on the Supreme Court, right? <laughs> right? Uh, and so the amazing thing is that... But so that well, let me say with a man on the Supreme Court, uh, what's wrong with his life story? And why shouldn't we be inspired by that? Because a lot of, well, we should be. A lot of us have it. Yeah, <laughs> have, have, and have, you do have too. Very, very, sure. very, very similar. I, I guess the, 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 the regretful thing is that he, and I think like some others, are not able to resist what must be a tr tremendous temptation to say what the dominant group wants you to say. And to believe it. He does believe it. Because clearly. I think he, I think yeah. he does. I and think does Thomas Sowell, and, and does uh, and, Shelby Steele, and, and does... And, he, and, you know, he's entitled to his, his, his yeah. view. The problem is that when a black says things like that, it has a weight and a volume uh, far greater than the rest of us who are b back there crying. Yeah. And what is, well, because he is saying what an awful lot of the society uh, wants to hear. The problem is, is as I look at it, and is that how, if the numbers are overwhelming. I mean, as, you, as proud as we can all be of singular success stories and people who have shown that they have through, are to be admired for their own achievements, it is those numbers are overwhelming. As you yeah. said, when you look at, at the distribution of wealth A in the country, and when you look at, at, at uh, whatever new wealth was accumulated during the 80s, what percentage of that went to the people, and when you look at how many young black men between the ages of 20 and 30 are in prison. But look, 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 at the, look at the greater picture. What does Kevin Phillips tell us? That the top right. two million people in this country earn more than the next 100 million. Now that, that is shocking. That is a shocking disparity in the wealth. And it, it's, it's worse now than any time since, say, 1929. Is your indictment of capitalism then? That, it, that, that, in fact, racism has to go hand in hand with capitalism? It, it doesn't have to. In fact, it does, you see. Racism, ever since slavery, has provided this stabilizing uh, influence. It is what those on top have used to keep those on the bottom, if not satisfied, at least quiescent, you see. When the working class agreed with the slave owners that they had to stand together to protect against slave revolts. The working class at that point put itself in a subservient position for the rest of their lives because they couldn't buy slaves. They were never going to be able to compete. And something like that has happened since the mid-1600s. 
when you see. And it, it's a, it, it, it works very well, Charlie. It works very well. Look at Senator Helms, right? right? Senator Helms is not only conservative on civil rights, he's conservative on everything. And he was losing that election and needed to lose that election given the conditions in North Carolina. One TV ad reminding them that, hey, we got to stay together against them. And he's back in office. Well, I, I know a little bit about that particular <laughs> race uh, that, that Helms ran. And you're right, in mm -hmm. fact. I mean, it was, it was, it was a very tight race. Uh, Harvey Gantt, a black architect, was doing, uh, running a remarkable mm -hmm. campaign and could have won. And there was a, a, a commercial mm -hmm. that showed white hands tearing up a uh, mm -hmm. uh, job application, I think it was, basically said, went to, uh, you know, whatever. To a less qualified. Of, that's right, a man that, that had, like, whatever it said, yeah. you know. Uh, but I, I want to come back to, I mean, the, that's not new, you know, the use of flagrant symbols in politics, and will be continued to use of all, of, of a variety of kinds in terms of inciting fear, in turn, and that really speaks to what you're talking about, because it is the fear of, of, of economic loss, is it not? I mean, if you can look to those... Well, it's the fear of economic loss by those on the bottom. That's There's I mean. not the same fear of economic loss by those on the top, you see. When, when, when you point to the guy who's making $500,000 a, a year, most of the society says, well, he must, he must earn it. Yeah. You see. I wish I could be there. Don't take it away because one of these days I might get there or my kids might get there. It's, it's the fear of loss by those who are designated bottom hitters. That is, that but is I suspect, I don't know my numbers, and I'm not prepared to make this argument. I suspect, and you've looked at the numbers, but I suspect you could look at the numbers. And, and, and maybe this is at the core of your argument, and I'm on very weak ground here. But you could look at the numbers and, and show that if you look at black Americans, African Americans in this country, that their economic life, in 1992, notwithstanding what happened to them in the 80s, is better than it was in 1952. No, it's wrong. It's, it's, it's not. It's, it's worse. That's, that's More the people are worse off. That's right. Now, relative yeah. to others or just yeah. within their own context? Uh, there are a lot of people who are worse off now yeah. because of the, what's happened in the, in the 80s uh, with jobs going off to Singapore and yeah. Philippines and what have you. Uh, but the overall... Now, some blacks... A, a small category and the middle class have done better. It's yeah. clear, but the but the overall situation is is worse. The, the, but speaking uh, of that, I mean, there's some will make the point that that those Black Americans who have made it are not doing enough to reach back. I, I, is that true in your I, judgment? You know, you could always do more, yeah. but I think that th those kinds of stories don't make the news. Right. You see, uh, but there are an awful lot of church groups, small independent uh, s s uh, sororities, and what have you. But it, this is a government problem. When, when, the, when, the, when the savings and loans fail, uh, no one said, okay, all you savings and loan um, uh, bank holders, uh, get together and do something about it. The, the government came in. When the problem is so large, that's what government is for. Yeah, but I mean, let's take that for a second. I agreed. And a lot of people said, you know, and, and, and with very, with adeptly said, if they can save the savings and loan and all those rich stockholders, the savings yeah. and loan, then why can't they say, why the can't cities. they use that money, A, for education of our children, use that money for health care, that kinds of things, those examples where we see, or for economic self-help programs, for economic programs or public works programs. A lot of things. Why can't they use that money to give those people who uh, who don't have a job? A lot of issues. A lot of people pointed to the say the savings and loan scandal and the government bailout to say, and it was scandalous. At the same time, the argument is made: the purpose of that bailout, in part, was to save the savings of average Americans. That's why it had to be done. It wasn't just to rescue some investors. But the, the point, Right? The, but you the, give me that? The technical aspect is, is, uh, of your answer is correct. But the need, uh, the moral uh, obligation uh, is the same. The problem is that in our society, uh, market forces uh, have more clout uh, than moral uh, forces, and that's part. That's that. That is part of our problem, and, that's not and part new. of the reason. And that's, that's certainly that's certainly is yeah. Let me just say that you've got two candidates running. We've got a number of candidates. Two candidates in the Democratic, more than two, but two primary candidates running for the Democratic nomination for president. Uh, if and let's assume there's a nominee of the Democratic Party in 1992. 
and he came to you and he said, Professor Bell, tell me what kinds of things I should be articulating that economically will make a difference in those people we've been talking about. What kind of programs? And he might say, is it too late? Are you saying that racism is so inbred because of economic forces uh, there is nothing we can do or... The problem I would warn him is that he should talk in terms of general need uh, to do now what Roosevelt did in the early 30s with, 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 with the New Deal. Uh, the need is greater, uh, our need, debt is greater. The need to create jobs. That's right. See, if we had, we have a, a free, a right of free speech, uh, freedom of worship, uh, right to trial by jury and whatever, none of it's worth much of a damn yeah. unless you have money. What we really need is a, uh, is a right of, uh, of everybody to... But then to that becomes an economic but, argument as but, to how to create jobs. But, and, and who is to say that Paul Songus and what he's talking about is any less wise than Bill Clinton, any less wise than George Bush, who sort of wants to let the economy figure it out itself? Yeah. Well, letting it figure out itself, we know from any okay. number of experiences, right. that doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work very well. The, the challenge that individual is going to have in articulating that is that the it's, it's the problem reformers have always had, and it goes back to race, because it's very easy for those who are opposed to it to somehow twist this around and that prison reform is to help those uh, uh, those criminal elements in the black uh, class, uh, that the uh, welfare is to help those mothers having babies, uh, you know, and, and these things subtly or not subtly tend to undermine uh, uh, the value and, and the worth of programs that everyone, everyone needs. Affirmative action, here come the listeners, affirmative action helps a hell of a lot more white people than it does blacks. You oh, see. Poor white people. And uh, uh, middle class. Right. As well. Because affirmative action cuts into the privilege uh, in which most of our uh, um, um, uh, qualifications and things are, are really are Affirmative, really affirmative action helped Judge Clarence Thomas, too. That's right. night. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and, absolutely. He, and he's not an enthusiastic supporter not, not of affirmative action. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with, there's nothing wrong with, I assume, I mean, what I hear you saying as you first talked about this, someone, an old friend who I respect, is you, you said it's hopeless. It's hopeless. It seemed to be no. what you're going to say in the keynote, no. that, that it's built into that's the right. system. But that's different from saying it's hopeless. Okay, then where's the hope? Rather than hope, you start with recognition. Right. If you recognize... Let's just say, my forebears, the slaves, who, without whose courage and strength I wouldn't be here, recognized that slavery was permanent. It was not going to end in their lifetime in the 1700s and the early 1800s and what have yeah. you. And having recognized that, faced up to it, they then dealt with life as, as it was presented to them. They didn't despair and give up to it, right. or a lot of them didn't. And they survived the worst form of slavery probably the world has ever known, and nevertheless maintained their humanity and provided uh, 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 much of what we call American culture in terms of music and dance and uh, expression and, and what have you. Now, damn it, if they could do that, we can face up to the reality of racism as a permanent part of stabilizing force in the society and challenge it and fight it. Uh, in that way. At the point that we challenge it and commit ourselves to it, at that point we as individuals and as a group are triumphant. Yes. You see. Our obligation by whoever sent us here was not to win, yeah. not to overcome, but to recognize evil and, and, and try to change yeah. it. I think that regardless of the party or the president, I mean the hottest place in hell ought to be reserved for those with the power of that office who don't offer either the moral leadership and who don't say what a significant problem racism is in America, mm -hmm. and therefore began to say, I may not have the answers, but I do have an ear, and I do want to put this on the front burner of the consideration of what this nation is about. It's and pretty hard for anybody who gets there to have that vision. That's one of the Why? Because the they, what, what, what is the... It, the uh, for, there are too many... What is the shaping influences yeah. that take in that instinct out of you? Yeah. 
I don't know. The thing is, I've been reading the New Yorker series about Jesse Jackson. I have. Marshall I Frey was here. Marshall, no, oh, is that right? Was on this broadcast. Because I thought it was a very Frey fine too. job. Was here I mean, he talked ago. about the shortcomings, the right. weaknesses, but also the strengths. And one of his strengths was vision. Right. He had a vision of what this country could be for white people, for black people, and what have you. And and I often often pray, and I tell my students, what we need is a white Jesse Jackson. So you wouldn't have that vision. And the students told me, Professor Bell. That's a contradiction in terms, you see. And I fear that may be, at once you're part of the family, right. you see, that there seems to be a built-in inability almost to speak the truth as Jackson often did, to, to win people beyond their, the kinds of things that we've been talking about, the kinds of attachments based on race and class, and to see problems and get determination to do it. To do it. And, and we, just, we just don't have that. What's the role of the black, black intellectual? To try to understand it and speak as honestly as, 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 as they can. Let me look at your own personal case now for a second. Now, what is it that, what's your quarrel with Harvard? I think that Harvard, as the leading institution, has an obligation to do what you were just saying you would like to see the president do. And that is to look at itself, face up to the uh, unjustified elitism, uh, and say, we are going to change. Now, They've done a good job with regard to uh, uh, how they admit students as opposed to the old days when you looked to who, who his father was and who his right, grandfather right. was, and they either got in or didn't on, a ba on that basis. Uh, but they and they merit as well. Yeah, and they, and they, and they have, but they haven't done that with, with, with the faculty. When I was hired as the first black in 1969, you can't tell me You were the first black in 1969 to sit on the Harvard faculty right. to be a member on of the law faculty. faculty. Yeah. yeah, on the law faculty. You, on the law faculty. Right. You can't say that there was nobody good enough who was black before me. That's crazy. I came along at a time when there were a lot of pressures that indicated to them they needed somebody. And I remember uh, spending a lot of time with the dean, myself and my late wife, saying, listen, I'll be the first as a pioneer, I'm not, I, but I'm not interested in coming as a token. And they, and they assured me I would be the first and not the last. Well, for 22 years, uh, I have been struggling to get them to to uh, keep uh, to main, you know keep that promise. What we have a, a goodly representation of black faculty, but most of them have been hired during times of crisis, just as when I was hired. There has not been an opening up of those uh, hiring standards and and policies, so that we would not only have uh, women of color. Uh, we, most of our minority st students are, are women, uh, but not only that, we have uh, we have Charlie one Irish American on it. You mean to tell me there's only one person of Irish American extraction that's good enough to be in a Harvard Law School? That's crazy. We have no Italian Americans. We have no Poles. On the, on the law school on the whole On the law school faculty, right. you see. So that, that, so that the focus in my interest and what have you, certainly with, with regard to minority representation on the faculty. But as so often is the case, the problems that minorities are complaining about uh, are dramatic instances of injustices uh, that are visited across much of the uh, population based on class. What's going to happen to you? Oh, I, I, um, I, I really believe that life is challenge, and that I also believe that tenure uh, corrodes an awful lot that I value. In, 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 in myself and that I think others should value in themselves. So that the likelihood is why I'm appealing uh, uh, their two-year rule that says you're out of here if you yeah. don't come back after right. two years. I don't expect to win. Uh, and I, I'm 61 years old, I feel very happy uh, teaching here a year, teaching right. someplace else a year. They say those... So you mean you can live your life without going back to Harvard? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank Good you very you. much. Very Good much. to see you. Derek Bell, professor of law at NYU now, formerly of Harvard. Uh, you, you may be seeing him at your local law school. You never can tell.